Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me for our Bible study this week. As you can see, I'm on my way to an exotic location to video this uh, study, and it's a, a place that has nice waves, beaches, things like that. So I've uh, been th thinking about a particular scripture that I was reading uh, while I was uh, on this flight, and um, it's, I mean, you all know this passage. It's the one about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus by night and said, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And now I'm pretty sure Jesus knew exactly how he was going to answer the question he would ask. And so Jesus said, well, how do you see it? And he uh, uh, reminded him about uh, some of the laws. And his response was, I've obeyed them since I was a boy. And I'm pretty sure Jesus realized that maybe he hadn't obeyed all of them. And so his command to him was, uh, give all your money to the poor and come and follow me. It was a total change in his life. And he went away sad. But you see, we're a lot like the rich young ruler sometimes because we come to Jesus and, and say, How, what can I do? And, 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 and we try to do things that will help us to be in good stead with him. In fact, as I was traveling here, I, I got to watch several of my favorite movies. And so we're going to watch a couple of uh, clips that gave me an idea about some things we want to watch out for. And so uh, the first uh, clip is uh, one of my favorites in Star Wars. It's, it's from um, Return of the Jedi when Luke Skywalker is uh, addressing his father. So let's just watch this clip. This is a rebel that surrendered to us. Although he denies it, I believe there may be more of them, and I request permission to conduct a further search of the area. He was armed only with this. Good work, Commander. Leave us. Conduct your search and bring his companions to me. Yes, my lord. The Emperor has been expecting you. I know, Father. So, you have accepted the truth. I've accepted the truth that you were once Anakin Skywalker, my father. That name no longer has any meaning for me. It is the name of your true self you've only forgotten. I know there is good in you. The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. It, Paul had this to say in Romans. He said, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. And see, Luke was uh, thinking, you know, there's a little bit of good in his father, Darth Vader, who was probably the most evil man in the universe at the time. And, and sometimes we think that about, about ourselves or our friends. We, we tend not maybe to believe that the Bible is really true when when it says when it talks about us not having any good in us we tend to, tend to think that there's some good in us and in our friends and so sometimes it keeps us from sharing the our faith with people because well they're pretty good and maybe they'll be okay on their way to heaven but the bible says that's not true second clip is um from uh, one of my favorite movies the princess bride and um uh this just to set the stage, the, the hero in this movie is Wesley, and the bad guy, Prince Humperdinck, has just tortured him and almost killed him, and so his friends are trying to uh, save his life. So here's, uh, here's uh, uh, just watch this clip. His daddy can't talk. Look who knows so much, huh? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. 
Yeah. Mostly dead. He's slightly alive. Yeah. All dead. Well, with all dead, there's usually only one thing that you can do. What's that? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. So, Scripture says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Paul is uh, pretty, pretty clear about that. And in Colossians, he says this, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sin. So the, the point is, we are dead in our sins. That's, that's what sin does to us. It makes us dead. And uh, Wesley, you know, mostly dead. I don't, I don't think so. That's not what scripture says. He's talking about the fact that because of the sin that we have in our life, we are actually dead spiritually. And uh, I think we sometimes have trouble believing that because we want to think that there's still some good in us. And then uh, the third uh, clip that uh, I have here is from Lord of the Rings. And uh, one of my favorite uh, films, this is about um, uh, the, the ring when it was first discovered. And um, it's, Schmeagel is the, the one who discovers it and, and he finds it. And then it, this clip shows how he changes because of what the ring does to him. So let's just watch this clip. So Schmeagel was changed totally. I mean, his attitude, even his name was changed to Gollum. It just changed everything about him. And that's what sin does to us. It changes us. And in fact, uh, Paul talks about it, uh, sin, uh, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's what sin does. It, it causes us to change and, and everything in us needs to be taken care of. Uh, that's the really whole reason Jesus Christ came, was to pay for the price of our, the sin in our life. Not only that, but creation is affected by sin. Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, so that it would be liberated from its bondage to decay, since creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. That's what Paul said. Even creation, the whole universe, has been affected by sin. It just changes everything. And then in Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Sin may, is the reason why Jesus had to die on the cross. That's the reason. Sin is so evil, so terrible. It just changes everything. And so uh, Romans 1 also says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth in their wickedness. Sin just ruins people's lives and it, it comes along so easily because, you know, well, in our life, we might ask God, why, 
uh, what, what can I do to be better? But what we're really hoping he might say is, well, you're, you're pretty good. I'll, I'll take you. I'll take you. I'll take you. And sometimes when that doesn't happen, we go for self-help books or we try whatever next best thing somebody suggests. And so often sin is what comes because while well, the world is pushing sin and our flesh wants the sinful thing and Satan is always tempting us with sin. And so we start out and, and just like Schmeagel with the ring, it just was shiny and beautiful. And then it just started changing him and it changed him and it changed him and, it, and pretty soon it's taken over everything. Well, as we consider um, Romans chapter nine, if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have anything good in us. We would be totally dead, totally evil, because Jesus is the one who paid for that. So in just a few minutes, we'll uh, have our Bible study in Romans when we look at uh, Paul's look at free will versus God's sovereignty. And uh, it's a pretty interesting study. So I'll see you there. So what do you think? Looks pretty good, doesn't it? But we're uh, here to study the book of Romans, and uh, we're in chapter 9, where God is, uh, Paul is talking about God's sovereignty versus a man's free will. And it, it, it's pretty interesting because God has a plan, and we've been watching his plan all through the book of Romans, and it's not going to stop here. It just keeps on going and going. He has plans. But he also gives mankind some free will. And sometimes he tells us we need to pursue this thing. We need to go do this thing. We need to choose to do the right thing. And so it's interesting. There's no place in scripture where any of the writers in talk about how does God's sovereignty and our free will cross? How, how does it work out? And, and so here's the way somebody described it once to me. God's sovereignty is like uh, one of the railroad tracks on a train. It keeps on going. God has a plan, and he's had it from the beginning, and it'll keep on going. And man's free will also, he gives us free will, and somewhere in there we get to use free will uh, in the middle of his plan. But because they're railroad tracks, they keep going parallel. They never meet, and we will not know how they turn out until we get to heaven. And so I've decided that when we're talking about God's sovereignty, I'm just going to talk about it like there is nothing else but God's sovereignty, the way he works it out. And when he talks about us making choices and having free will, I'm going to talk about it that way. And we're going to try to do our best to make all the best choices. And one day when we get to heaven, we'll see how they all mix. But Paul uh, is talking here. Uh, he he. he puts his discussion about this in four different uh, topics. And no surprise, he asks some questions along the way because he imagined somebody's asking those questions. And my guess is you might have asked some of these questions. And so let's um, look at uh, what Paul has said here in Romans chapter 9. So the first question is, uh, has God failed to keep his promises? No, is the answer, because he has not failed to keep his promises. And here is a, a, a key verse, uh, verses six and seven, where uh, Paul says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who descended from Israel are Israel, neither are they all children, uh, because they are Abraham's descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. So Paul is suggesting here that there are lots of Jewish folks who have Jewish DNA but they were not true Jewish people. I mean, they were true physically Jewish people, but not spiritually. And, and he, he makes a couple of different uh, dis discussions. First of all, um, there, were, there were two kinds of Jews. There were the kind that were born Jews and the kind who were faith Jews. And Abraham had two sons, um, Isaac, who was the son of promise, and Ishmael, who was not the son of promise. And, and, uh, Isaac was the 
promise embracer, Ishmael was the promise rejecter. And, and Paul is suggesting that all Jewish people from the time of Abraham until even this day, every Jewish person fits into one of those two categories. They're either um, a promise embracer or a promise rejecter. And then uh, he goes on to Isaac, his son, Abraham's son, who also had two sons. One was Jacob, the other was Esau. Jacob started out pretty rough, but actually he turned it around later in his life. <coughs> Can you cut that out? <laughs> Isaac had two sons. Uh, he, he had Jacob, who was pretty rough in his early life, but turned it around later in his life, and his brother Esau, who traded his stake in God's kingdom for a bowl of soup. And so Esau represents all those Jewish folks who traded obedience to God's promises for indulging in the lusts of the flesh. And so there's always been two kinds of people, uh, two kinds of Jewish people. So then, someone said, the Jews' re rejection of Jesus is not evidence that God lost some of the sons and daughters he foreknew and predestined because he never knew them. There were always some folks who never were willing to accept God's promises on faith. They always wanted to do it themselves. Uh, question number two. Is God unfair in how he dispenses mercy? And the answer is no, he is not unfair. And here is what uh, he says in verses 14 and 15. What should I say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The real question is, did God do something wrong by showing mercy only to Jacob and not to Esau? He foreknew him and chose him, and he did not do that for Esau. So here's a definition of mercy. Receiving something that you do not deserve. That's mercy. That's what God gives many people. So if you deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. It would be called justice. And God doesn't owe anyone mercy. So it's not unfair for him to show it for some and not for others. See, God doesn't really owe us mercy. Justice, perhaps, but not mercy. Here's Paul's reasoning. Does God uh, owe anyone salvation? Not really. Uh, he owes is he free to give it to whomever he wants? Can he give it to a few folks? Can he give it to some folks? Can he give it to everybody if he chooses to? It's his choice because it's mercy. God would have done none of us injustice by leaving us to perish. See, we've all chosen to be sinful. We've all chosen sin in our life. And he, it, it wouldn't be unjust for him to say, okay, fine, just follow your sin and you'll pay the consequences of that. If we were left to perish, it would have been our own choice. Remember Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, where it was talking about everyone is a sinner. All kinds of people are sinners, and all of us need help with the sin that's in our life, and the only way we can get it is by accepting Christ as our Savior who paid the price for our sin. So if any of us get salvation, it's by sheer grace. It is not because we deserve it. We have nothing good in us. There's nothing good. And so it's by grace that we get it. And so Paul said, let us make sure that we see things clearly here. Here's what John Stott said about this. Paul's way of defending God's justice is to proclaim his mercy. That may seem backward to us, but it is not. Paul is indicating that the question itself is misconceived because the basis on which God deals savingly with sinners is not justice, but mercy. That's what God is giving us when we accept his son as our personal savior. He is giving us mercy. So you ask, why does God choose some and not others? Good question. Actually, I think Paul thought you were going to ask that question. So here it is, verse 16. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. It doesn't depend on us, on what we can do, how good we are, how beautiful we are, how smart we are, 
And God didn't look down and say, oh, you deserve it. I'll give it to you. Or, oh, they were so much more sincere than the other person. Or they have a lot of potential. Or, oh, they just got dealt a bad hand. The truth is none of us deserve mercy. We don't deserve it because we have this sin in our life and it was his choice to give us grace if we were interested in having it. And by the way, he didn't do eeny, meeny, miny, mo either. That's not the way he made the choice. Paul actually never said that God didn't have any reasons for choosing us. It's just that the reasons did not correspond to our goodness. It had to do with other things. And because we get it by mercy and grace, we can't feel superior to all those folks out there who have not yet received his grace because we didn't deserve it either. It was a gift. And so we need to keep our pride in check on that. And so here's another verse. Paul gives us a hint about this in verse 17. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raise you up for this reason so that I may display my power in you and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You remember the story. Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. Uh, Moses came, said, let my people go. God wants them to be able to go. Pharaoh said, nope, I am in charge here, and they're my people, and I'm not turning them loose. And so uh, it's interesting what God's opinion was of this. Uh, God's not choosing Pharaoh was so that through his resistance to the Pharaoh's resistance, God would be able to put his power and glory on display for the whole world to see. And Pharaoh rejected God's uh, command. He also became an enemy of the, the God's chosen people and of God because he was unwilling to do what God wanted. In other words, Pharaoh's hard heart gave God the opportunity to show his power over wickedness and his loving commitment to his children. So how about number three? Is God unjust in holding us accountable? Well, how about this verse? Verse 19, you will say to me, therefore, why then does he find fault for who can resist his will? In other words, back to Pharaoh, he was just playing the role that God wanted him to play. So should he be held accountable by God for what he did? See, I mean, that's we ask the same question. Uh, should we be held accountable for the bad decisions that we make, even though God's going to get glory from it? In other words, if God is the one who's in control uh, of who hears and believes, how can he condemn those who simply play the role he has assigned to them? Paul knew you would be asking this. And so here's the way it went with Pharaoh. Pharaoh rejected God first many times, several times, actually, and early on, he, he rejected God. He was unwilling to do what God wanted. He had a hard heart. And even through the first five plagues, he hardened his heart each time afterwards until finally, after the sixth plague, God hardened his heart. And so God probably said, okay, hey, if that's what you want, you want a hard heart, let me help you with that. And so God wasn't to blame for Pharaoh's hard heart. Pharaoh was the one to blame because he was the one who was hardening his heart. Someone's rejection of God is always presented this way as they harden their hearts. Even Jesus uh, said that. Jesus uh, in Matthew 23 said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who uh, sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. See, people often are not willing to be gathered by God to receive the blessings that God wants to give. He foreknows them and elects them and calls them, and but they're just not willing to do that. C.S. Lewis correctly said, hell is always a door first locked from the inside. Interesting, I thought. And John Stott said, if anyone is saved... The credit is God alone. But if anyone is lost, the blame is all theirs. I think that's what Paul's saying here. It's what he means. Number four, question Paul's asking, is God's choice to save only some inconsistent with his goodness? 
And I think the answer is no. In other words, why would a good God let anyone perish? See, that's the question. And many people in today's world ask that question. Why would God let some people uh, perish and go to hell? Here's what Paul said in verses uh, 20 to 23. But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? He's talking to us, people who ask this question. Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, desiring to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath ready for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared before in glory? See, it's interesting. If God uses your own free choices to reject him and set up his display of glory, is that, is that not okay? Can we accuse him of being unjust? But you say a good God would have different plans for his creation. Really? So you think... If you're asking this question, of course, if you think you have a better plan for how things would work out in this world, I mean, here we have God who is the ultimate in the universe, has all wisdom, all knowledge, all the power that it took to create the universe and all kinds of other things, and we think we'd be wiser and better at it than he was. See, our problem often is we always think about things from our point of view. But God thinks about things from his point of view, and he's always interested in his glory. That's part of everything that he does, including salvation. It's for his glory that he does many of the things that he does. Here's a, another quote by Tim Keller. <clears throat> if God had mercy on all or condemned all, we would not see his glory. I don't think Paul is giving us much more than a hint here, but it is a very suggestive hint. For the biggest question is, if God could save everyone, why doesn't he? And here Paul seems to say that God's chosen course to save some and leave others will in the end be more fit to show forth God's glory than any other scheme we can imagine. <clears throat> I think that's what Paul's saying. It's hard for us to realize how important God's glory is to him because <clears throat> we think of ourselves. How about... I don't know, it hasn't been that many years ago that we, meaning human beings and scientists, thought the Earth was the center of the universe. We thought we were the most important thing. And as it turns out, it's a pretty good thing that we're not because the Earth never would have been able to hold the universe together like the sun does. And the truth is, God is the center of the universe. You look up there and there's billions of galaxies. God has got to be at the center of it. And he is the one who holds things together. And we sometimes think we have such a better idea. And here we are, a small speck on a slightly bigger speck in a small backwoods galaxy on some, in some corner of the universe. And we just think that we have everything together and we know all about it. So I think we need to remember that God has a pretty good plan. Here's uh, some more that he says, some other reasons he gives. 20, verse 25, he also says in Hosea, I will call not my people my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. This is an extraordinary promise that we get from uh, Hosea. Israel's rejection of Jesus allowed us Gentiles to find him, to gain salvation. Even Israel's rejection served a larger purpose than just for their country, for their people. So, you might ask, why did those Jewish people reject Jesus, the Messiah, who came to them in their country, where they had heard about him coming and expected him to come and all kinds of things. Why did they reject him? And here's Paul's response. But Israel, pursuing the law for righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? 
because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Jesus was the stumbling stone. Notice his answer is not, God made it so. God appointed them to not uh, accept Christ their Savior. That wasn't it. It was that they were unwilling to humble themselves to accept a gospel that required them to not do anything to get it. They wanted, they wanted to be known for obeying the law, and they expected the Messiah when he came to come and give them awards for being such wonderful, good folks, for, for obeying the law so well like nobody else did. They expected him to come in on a white horse and have an award ceremony for them. But when Jesus announced that it was only by grace, they were not interested because they wanted to gain salvation by what they did. So they wouldn't humble themselves and admit that they needed it, so they rejected him. And the truth is, all of us would do the very same thing unless God gave us the insight to see. When he called us, remember last time we talked about him calling us, when he calls us, he opens our eyes so we can see the truth and we can decide one way or the other. But without, without that, we too would have been going down the same road that they went. Here's a true story. It's a story about a lady who, um, as a young girl, lived, grew up in a family. Uh, dad uh, was uh, absent much of the time, angry a lot of the time, always taking things out on her. She was uh, miserable, wanted to get out of the house. But at age 18, someone uh, took her to church and, and led her to the Lord. And um, she became a, a Christian. And so after she became a Christian one night, she was just laying there uh, in bed wondering and, and actually praying to God, saying, God, why, why did you save me? And she just kept asking and asking and wondering, God, why, why did you save me? And she said, I, I got an answer, almost as if it was allowed, but it wasn't. And, 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 and he quoted her this part of Romans chapter 9, where he said, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. She didn't understand at the time. What she was hoping for was that God would say, I saw something good in you. I, I saw some potential that you had. I, she was hoping for some sense of worth in her life because God had chosen her and was willing to save her. But then, as she was studying uh, in Romans and particularly in chapter 9, she, she realized that salvation is totally by grace. It's mercy on his part. It's totally by grace. It has nothing to do with whether she is good or bad. In fact, the truth is she's not good. She never was good until Jesus Christ gave her her goodness. And so then she began to understand because if God's love for her and his willingness to save her was not based on her goodness, then that means she didn't have to live up to anything. If she messed up, it didn't mean that God was going to quit loving her because he never loved her in the first place because she was so good. He loved her because of his character and because of who he was. And it helped her to understand that she could be assured that she would never, ever lose her salvation. It was a permanent thing, not dependent on how good she was. It was dependent on God, who was great and wonderful and would never leave her or forsake her. I think that's one of the main reasons Paul put Romans 9 in, the, in his book. And I think we need to spend a little time perhaps thanking God for his love for us and his mercy and the grace he showed us and the salvation he gave us because we did not deserve it, not at all.
And so may I make a little assignment here? May I make a suggestion? I'm going to suggest that you think about how you can show your love and appreciation for what God has done for you by choosing some area of obedience that you will decide, I am going to obey God in this way because he has asked me to. It will be a way for us to show him how much we appreciate what he's done for us. He has done so much, and we didn't deserve not one bit of it. I hope this helps you understand the, how God's sovereignty works in our lives, but it also allows for our free will. We need both of them. I hope this helps. Have a great week.